Every time I, I hear of these projected trips to the moon, Mr. Huxley, I ask myself the question which we used to see on uh, railroad stations during the war. Is this trip necessary? <laughs> well, it's certainly not necessary for me. I shall be the last tourist to go to the moon. I can't imagine any place I would less like to go to with temperatures of about a minus 160 and atmosphere like that twice as high as Mount Everest. I cannot conceive why anybody should want to go there, but this is evidently... A view not shared by everyone. Clifton Fadiman is our host. His guests are Aldous Huxley, distinguished author, and Mark Connolly, noted playwright. This conversation started several minutes ago. As we turn up the microphones, our conversationalists are discussing science fiction and its predictions of the future. Clifton Fadiman is speaking. Let's join them. I wonder oh, whether the, the interest in science fiction, Mr. Huxley, isn't connected with a profound displacement of man's interest, literary interest, let's say, from the human heart, the traditional subject matter of literature, to the machine. Uh, is it not possible that human beings are beginning to be bored with themselves as people, finding the machine a far more interesting thing to contemplate? And isn't science fiction merely the literature of technology as a, an, an attempt to, to deal with that displacement? But does that seem too fantastic? No, I think, Mr. Ferdinand, that's a possibility. Um, I think they'll find before very long that uh, the machine isn't as interesting as the human heart, but I, I think it's quite possible that they may now believe it is. And But uh, it seems to me that the um, actually we have such an infinite amount to do here to find out who, in fact, we are. We know we have, we have gone... Uh, have been very, very far from obeying the Socratic command to know ourselves. Uh, I think this will come back, but meanwhile we, we are roaming far afield in what seems to me ultimately a wild goose chase, but maybe we'll come back before it's too late. Do you think, uh, Mr. Huxley, we will arrive at it according to the plot conceived by Romain Roland in his... Uh, in his uh, scenario for a movie, which I don't believe was ever filmed, called The Revolt of the Machine. Do you remember that story? The uh, world is mechanized to such an extent that the pressing of a button by the president of the world, who happens to reside in Paris, by the mm -hmm. way, the pressing of that button will put into operation such a, an inclusive network of mechanical activity that man will not have to do anything more except uh, adventure in his spirit and really improve himself in areas where he's perhaps been denied improvement because of his concern with existence and, uh, and animal survival. That's well, something happens. Yeah. The machines become intelligent. They declare war on man, and the final scene, I thought, had a nice little ironic touch. The last man on Earth is fighting the last sensate piece of machinery, and he pounds it into a rather thin sheet of metal and begins forcing it through some ground that really needed some tilling. I see, and he, he wins finally. He I wins, but sure man has gone out. back to the simple plow again. I, I, uh, <laughs> the the uh, revolt of the robot, of course, is one of the uh, regular gimmicks, one of the regular gambits in, in all science fiction. It seems to me the difficulty is that while we may very well within a few hundred years have uh, constructed a system of machines that can do all our work for us, during that period of construction, we will have uh, lost our capacity for wonder and reflection. So that, they, that the new idleness that we will have at the end of, this time, of, of that period will do us no good. At the same time, I, I'm not so quite so pessimistic as you are, Mr. Federman, because there is already, it seems to me, going on a very curious phenomenon in this country. The fact that people are using their leisure to, to develop a new kind of artisan civilization, this do-it-yourself business. That's These, just think, due to the most, high price of plumbers, of course. It's mainly. partly due to the high price of plumbers, but it's also due to the fact that people want some sort of fun. And then this, uh, this other business, we've completely changed agriculture out of all resemblance to what agriculture used to be. But innumerable people, as I've found driving about the country, go out into the most remote places to hunt and camp and fish. Yeah. I, I think, in a, in a curious way, the, 
masses of the people are doing what the highbrows have despaired of their doing, finding some kind of remedy for this. Uh... Good for you. I'm delighted to see uh, this optimistic note creeping in, Mr. Huxley, considering the fact that your own scientific utopia, Brave New World, is well, hardly one to cheer people. No, it, it wasn't. And, of course, uh, there are these two trends going on, obviously. I mean, there's a... It seems to me the human race is engaged on several great crusades at the moment. First the crusade to kill itself completely, and then the crusade to turn real life into an exact similitude of the novels of Kafka. And finally, this crusade to realize Brave New World and uh, 1984. Well, but at the same time, there are other tendencies at work, and it's a question of which can work fastest. Uh, what do you feel yourself about the ideas that you expressed? Of course, that was some years ago in Brave New World. Do you think we've uh, progressed pretty far toward this uh, uh, iron-bound scientific utopia, a most depressing one, it seems to me? Well, uh, I think there's, I mean, certain things um, surprisingly come true already, I think. And uh, I think the great danger is actually talking about the future. The, and I was interested to see that uh, Professor Adrian, in his uh, address to the British Association just a few days ago, stressed this, that the, the real revolution is still in store, which is the biological and psychological revolution. Haven't we had enough revolutions, Mr. Huxley? Uh, well, uh, indeed, but I mean, the next revolution will really be the last one, the, the revolution which gets hold of individual minds and individual bodies and shapes them to the desires of the ruling uh, minority. Oh, don't you find this the most dismal prospect? I think it's a terrible prospect, and I was interested to see that Adrian says this is probably more dangerous than the atomic bomb. We understand that in Soviet Russia they're already doing things to uh, the human brain by means of pharmacological and other uh, techniques. I would think so. And uh, it's, uh, it is very alarming that I think both uh, in Russia and in Nazi Germany People went much further in this direction than anybody has thought of doing elsewhere, that it is the dictator who thinks of this thing, because it is the obvious next phase of the revolution. Well, Mr. Huxley, isn't that an evidence of the, the certainly what you're citing from Germany, uh, Nazi Germany and Russia, isn't that the, the hunger for the man on horseback? That seems to be part of, of, uh, of an abiding atavistic appetite in mankind. He, man must have somebody who is going to lead him into an adventure, whether that adventure is going to, uh, going to uh, result in his death or, or not, doesn't seem to matter, that we're, we're, uh, we're lemmings in, in the sense that we believe that the, the not impossible release is around the corner or will pop up tomorrow morning if we follow so-and-so tonight. That seems to me to make us seem much more gullible and credulous well, than I thought. aren't we? Has the human well, race ever evidenced uh, anything except that gullibility? Well, and uh, the trouble is that it seems to me this gullibility can be enormously increased by pharmacological and psychological means to the point where people will live uh, under the most iron dictatorship and imagine themselves happy and fulfilling their desires. Well, they will no longer be human beings in the traditional sense of the word. No, though. I think that is probably the great danger. This is what uh, Adrian was talking about just a few days ago. Aren't you saying, in effect, that what is may conceivably happen, I don't believe a word of this really, is that we are going to create artificially a, a new species. You, we might call it uh, Gainus Homo, but actually mm. it will be very different from... Uh, would any that of the three of us the... around this table? Well, it'd be awfully like the termites, I suppose. Mr. Connolly, you are going to say I was going me? to ask solely for information. Uh, the, the mutants that uh, one reads about occasionally, I've never found them defined, but I assume that they are projections of man's potentials toward either good or evil, mm. uh, who become, uh, become individual and articulate and uh, independent. Uh, Aren't they perhaps the, uh, the, the thing toward which the dangers you're, uh, you're citing uh, point to? So much of the science fiction, and I perhaps sound like the uh, little boy reciting what his aunt saw on, on New Year's Eve at one minute of twelve in the lonely house, but after all, uh, Wells in 1913... Uh, did anticipate in terms of fiction something which we certainly have most realistically before us today, he, he uh, prophesied in The World Set Free in 1913, mind you, he prophesied 
the making of artificial radioactivity in the year 1933, which happened to be the year in which it first appeared. Promotion of atomic energy. I think it's only fair to say uh, uh, for the writers of science fiction that there's an extraordinary amount of... Uh of accurate prophecy in what may seem to be their wildest dream. Well, after a look at all the things in Jules Verne which have come true. Yes, and H.G. And Wells, who, who mm. really predicted uh, land tanks mm. and predicted the form that aerial warfare was to take in both the Second and uh, First World War. And Wars. you remember, Mr. Fadiman, during the war, the story that went about uh, that the government was nicely puzzled as to whether it should ask the science fiction's magazines to stop stories speculating in the, uh, in the, on the employment of the atomic bomb. Do you remember my, the, that play by that old friend of mine, Miss Ferdinand, Robert Nichols, The Wings Over Europe? Oh, yes. yes, I do. That was in 1928, was it? 29, yeah. I think. Okay. And there was a, a full account of this atomic bomb. It seems to uh, me, gentlemen... The young man defied the old British yes, cabinet, I believe, to it. stop his mm. enterprise, yes. I would like to state, uh, particularly as I'm in the presence of uh, two distinguished writers, that if we wish to know what the future is going to be, the thing to do is not to listen to the scientists, but to the artists. It is they who have the uh, prevision. Mm. Uh, go back to old Roger Bacon, 13th century, Mr. Huxley, mm -hmm. was it? The, uh, of course, he didn't tell us just how these things were going to come about, but he predicted... Uh, uh, aviation, and that was an awfully long time ago. He talked of immediate transmission of words uh, over long distances. Uh, there must be something in the uh, artist mind that enables them to prevision the future. And uh, Da Vinci, too, while he didn't put it in terms of fiction, certainly anticipated an awful lot uh, in, a, in yeah. a speculative, almost romantic way. He and was obviously having fun as he did it. And yet, oddly enough, it's the, uh, it's the artist who's not listened to by the populace. Yes. And it's the statesman who is, who is unable to make provision beyond tomorrow. Because what's a very interesting thing, talking about going back to Wales, is to watch Wales's career as a prophet and science fiction writer, this curious up and down motion that he has. I mean, he passes from an almost manic optimism to terrible depressions about the future and back and forth. Yes, it's a very odd, it would be a very interesting thing to trace out in detail the curve of Wales's feeling about the future. Well, it, it, it went increasing, the curve increasingly went downward, that is, became well, in the uh, end more and more... it was absolutely uh, terrible. I mean, in the end, he not only regarded the fate of man uh, as completely done, finished with, but he seemed even to think that the cosmos had gone wrong. I can't understand the, the uh, desire on the part of contemporary man whom are a very small part, to abolish space, as they say. Why do we want to go uh, faster than we have ever gone before? Don't, isn't it true that when we abolish space, we, as it were, abolish a part of ourselves? Because a man who's moving about the surface of the Earth at a reasonable speed, let's say that of a railway train, uh, is still uh, moving about on the surface of his home. He's still a man, but if he's in a jet plane, he's just so much transportation. Well, I entirely agree with you, Mr. Fetterman. I remember when I was a boy, it was uh, I lived in the bicycle age, and consequently I knew every inch of territory in a radius of about five miles around my home, which was the time of get back and forth quite easily in a morning or an afternoon. Yeah. Now, if I pass through this same territory again, I'm through in 30 seconds, and I haven't the faintest notion what is around me. I do think we've lost enormously by this mania for abolishing space. We've, we've abolished the world. Here you find youngsters who uh, don't, aren't interested at all in the kind of simple fictions on which we were brought up as, as kids. Uh, now uh, you have to be a space cadet, you know, able to astrogate your nuclear fission-driven rocket on a routine run from Antares to Aldebaran, or, or you're no one. In the younger sense. What I want to know is, do children really believe that this has already happened? I have a, a feeling that they'll be desperately disappointed when they grow up to find that we haven't even got to the moon yet. <laughs> By the time they grow up, we may actually be on the moon, though. Well, I've heard predictions involving 50 years. There is still a uh, note of hope, I think, in the hanging on to ancient virtues in children. I heard two little boys on a bus the other day. They got... Uh, they sat on opposite seats, and I watched them. They were about ten years old, and they stared at each other. And finally, one sternly said to the other, My name's Friday. I'm a cop. 
<laughs> not tenth of the globe. <laughs> I, felt, I felt we were really back home again, <laughs> and the world was going along in a fairly orderly way. Is science fiction a, a, a uh, an actually new form, or do you think it has a lineage that goes back uh, beyond the last 25 or 30 years, or let's say 50 years? Where does it begin? Does it begin with H.G. Wells, would you say? Well, I suppose Verne is before Wells. I mean, I, but that was the first fully developed science fiction on a, a large scale, was all that series of yes. books by Jules Verne. Oh, the middle of the 19th century, then. Well, uh, the but how can Jules Verne be put in that category? Because Jules Verne, after all, did not imply any change in human behavior. And doesn't science, science fiction almost invariably uh, consider some some change in yeah. human behavior. I think that's a very important yes, point. Yes, I think that is a uh, that is a very important. Uh, point. That is the reason why Jules Verne seems so, as it were, uh, earthbound, mm. because it's uh, these are just people right. extending a few inches further uh, on uh, the the gadgets and gimmicks that were already available in the 19th century. But these new science fiction writers, their vision is is uh, is sweeping and, to my mind, terrifying. Have you ever thought, Mr. Huxley, of continuing uh, Brave New World or doing a sequel to it? Uh, yes, I have thought of um, doing the the other side, the the, the um, treating the opposite pole of a society in which uh, people had seriously tried to see how they could develop man's potentialities. It's um, an interesting problem. I haven't worked it out in detail yet, but I think it, w it would be worth trying. Uh, isn't the dilemma this? that as soon as you begin to plan that kind of improvement in a man's mental equipment, you are beginning to poison his mind at the same time. That is, as soon as you use techniques for improving the world, you automatically advance in the direction of mechanization. Well, these would be, what I'm thinking of, would be entirely a psychological approach. I would make it, I would, uh, my idea would be to set the thing in a in an earlier age of a lost island or something of the kind where they were, they were not using the most advanced techniques but merely using uh, psychological techniques of various kinds. Because as you say, the moment you start uh, using the latest technological devices, you, you do become the slave of this machine. Uh, it worries me. It seems to me that about, oh, I don't know, what shall we say, 1500, something of that sort, Man began to change radically. Instead of becoming, uh, instead of being as he was before, a delver into himself in an endeavor to find out who he was, he became a meddler. Uh, and his interest now becomes fixed on ch changing things as much as possible, beginning with the external world. It seems to me a fairly new idea. Uh, the Greeks weren't much interested in changing the external world, were they? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, well, yes. now were they? Well, I, I think certainly the the argument of the Greek fabulist, whether he was uh, whether he was Aesop or whether he was uh, Aristophanes, uh, thinking about birds, mm. uh, the frogs, surely uh, that was a, was meant as a therapeutic thing, and certainly the the observations of human conduct in the, in the Aesop fables oh, are, uh, are, are, are critical. They were. And, uh, and, and, and salutary in their intent. Yes, but they, they were interested in finding out more about human beings or making fun of human beings, perhaps. But, I mean, well, for example, they weren't interested, uh, Mr. Connolly, in, in utilizing what was already known in Alexandria, which was steam power. Yes. Hiero found a, a little machine for making the idols no, bob true. their heads and open the doors of the temples and so on. Yes. And, they, and this, of course, again, is a most curious thing. Even as late as the 18th century, the, uh, the robots were used solely for amusement. Yes. They made these mechanical flute players. And there was even, I remember, exhibited to Louis XV, a mechanical duck, which not only ate and digested, but also excreted and quacked and did everything. Yes, but they were toys. They were toys. And, uh, and this is a very curious thing, that and people didn't think of applying this fabulous ingenuity to practical affairs on a large scale till really very late on. And yet they could have done so. They could uh, have done so. A uh, uh, hero, the, the Alexandrian that you had used, mm. invented what is in effect the jukebox. Uh, a little machine, mm. uh, entirely similar to our jukeboxes. I, I suppose could have made a fortune out of it if he uh, had wanted to harness the gambling instinct of mankind, which was present then as it is now. But in, in what they seem to do is to make a... They, they turn their faces away 
with this, with this, with the possibilities of changing the external world at their command, they said, no, we're not interested. I, I ask you whether it is possible for the human mind to have made a sudden bolt of fuss that turned about well, around four or five hundred years ago. Uh, another very interesting point, Mr. Pedman, in relation to the Greeks, uh, the, this idea of hubris, you know, this, this insolence which is punished by the gods, it's not merely insolence towards other human beings, it's insolence towards nature. In uh, the Persians of Aeschylus, Xerxes is punished not merely because he's a, an aggressor who's tried to enslave the Greeks, but because he's bridged the Hellespont. Yes. He's done something to nature which a man has no right to do. And this uh, thing, I think, is very important. This, uh, in order to um, desire to make enormous changes in nature, you've got to cease to regard nature as divine, which uh, our ancestors did, I think. Or, to uh, put it theologically, you become subject to the sin of pride. It may be that uh, the interest in science fiction is even quasi-religious in its nature. You remember uh, Henry Adams's opposition of the Virgin and the Dynamo. Uh, it, it may be that we are going through some kind of religious displacement now and transferring our ritual feelings uh, from the Virgin, using that as a religious symbol, to the dynamo. That's a symbol of the machine. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to worship the machine uh, with a kind of uh, uh, awe and reverence that we associate with traditional religious worship, Mr. Huxley, do you think? I would doubt it, because after all, we made the machine and we know how it works. At least somebody of us knows how it works. I don't think you would, you would ever get that same sort of feeling. And the mystery will remain, after all. I mean, with the mystery of death, the mystery of suffering, all this will be there, whatever the degree of me mechanization. Will it, though? Uh, a mystery remains only if you think about it. Suppose uh, all our time and all our energy are devoted to manufacturing uh, better and more glorious machines. What time and what energy will be left uh, for thought about uh, love and death and the uh, other staples of uh, mystical experience? You don't think people will sometimes lie awake at night? I ask you, as an expert in these mm. matters. Well, I think they will, but uh, maybe, of course, they, they can then take magnificent euphoric pills which will banish all these things. Dispel their mystic vision. Yes. What is the attraction science fiction has uh, for the, the highly trained intellect, do you think? Now, here are these crazy dreams of space travel and all that sort of thing. Now, it does begin to sound silly when you uh, talk about it coolly around a table like this. And yet, uh, these visions... Uh, do uh, apparently interest highly trained intellects, physicists, chemists, and so forth. Well, Leo Szilard uh, writes the things too, you know. Leo Szilard, you mean the great uh, I mean, physicist. The physicist? Yes, he actually writes. Them, oh he? yes, I've read three or four. I don't mm. know how many of them have been published, but I, I have seen them si simply because of personal acquaintanceship. Yeah. Have you and, asked? Oh, they're wonderful. I don't think I don't know how many of them have been published. I doubt that very many have. I asked him once why he didn't publish them, and he thought someday, I believe he said he might put them in a book. Isn't it, isn't it curious that scientists in our time of uh, premier caliber, like your friend Mr. Zillard, should uh, divert themselves with these strange daydreams, whereas, uh, let us say, in the 19th century, I'm sure your distinguished ancestor, uh, Mr. Huxley, uh, would have felt it uh, childish for him to indulge in, uh, in such speculations. Isn't it, did, 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 uh, uh, yes, I, I, I think he would have felt it rather frivolous to do that because he, he had a, such a, uh, a sort of reverential attitude towards science that this would have been like um, playing the harmonica in church or something of the kind. Ah, but that, that, that's an interesting point. That reverential attitude, which you find expressed uh, in his work and in Darwin's and mm. indeed all of the uh, great scientists of the 19th century, seems to have changed in our time. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, possibly defensively, the poor scientist has had to put a, cast himself in the role of a good fellow. He, oh, uh, you think this is just oh, part I, of the democratic I think part of it. I think it's part of it. I think protective part of coloration. It's protective coloration. Mm. This wants to be one of the boys. He, uh, I think he has to because the scientist has not had really the easiest road to travel in all the... <laughs> all the uh, well, then, of course, another thing one must remember in the 19th century, uh, these things would have been so remote. I mean, they, they had none of the possibilities which we have for traveling into outer space. Uh, they, yeah. Their means were frightfully primitive. I mean, when you think that 
Kelvin thought that the sun would burn itself out in 40 million years. I mean, all this thing has enlarged to such an incredible extent. And then look at the realm of history. After all, in my own lifetime, history has enlarged a thousandfold. Uh, I remember when I was brought up uh, at, with Greek history at school, uh, the, um, my known civilization had not yet been discovered, and we were told all sorts of nonsense about Homer. And all this, this enormous enlargement of both uh, time and space, which has happened within the last 50 years. I think we can sum this thing up by saying that uh, science fiction, uh, whether it presents a uh, dismal world of the future or a radiant world of the future, nevertheless is a, is a new development in thought. It, uh, it represents a vast reaching out toward new visions on the part of uh, imaginative men. A great deal of it and seems to me to have a kind of wild poetry. Uh, it's as if science fiction is a kind of wild child uh, begotten by imagination on the body of technology. Our host was Clifton Fadiman, author, critic, and regular essayist for Holiday Magazine. His guests were Aldous Huxley, author of many brilliant books, including The Brave New World, and Mark Connolly, author of the Pulitzer Prize-winning play Green Pastures.